the cloud. And we want to share screen. Yes, you are all there. If it becomes distracting, we'll just turn off that video feed. Um, but for the most part, we care about the slides, right? And the notes I'm taking on the slides. So bioluminescence happens is basically a very specific case of fluorescence, which is um, just tied to how we promote electrons. You can promote electrons go from a low energy level to a higher energy level. So if we start with two electrons here, we can shine light which we represent as this wavy arrow, or sometimes just with the letters H, H nu to indicate that that's, um, that that's light or energy in the form of light. You can take one of those electrons and you can promote it to the higher energy level, right? And then when it falls back down, it gives off light. So when things absorb light, you're moving electrons to higher energy levels. When things give off light, it's when you have a high energy electron that's falling back down. But this happens in living organisms too. So it's not just using the electrical energy or the, the heat that we're going to see in lab. Um, photosynthesis is taking light energy, promoting an electron, and then using that high energy electron to make sure. Bioluminescence is the exact opposite. It's taking the energy from sugar or ATP using it to promote an electron and then letting the electron fall back down on its own to produce light. So they're inverse operations, right? The same way that an LED works by using electricity to promote electron, then it falls back down. Photovoltaics, which is a solar cell, takes in light and uses the high energy, electro, high energy electron to produce current. Instead of using current to produce light, it uses light to produce current. Plants and bioluminescent organisms do the exact same thing, except that they do it with chemical energy instead of electrical energy. Electrical energy is really just a specific form of chemical energy. Right? So all of these bioluminescence is tied to all the same things we're talking about, which is kind of cool. Um, we can start talking about you know green fluorescent protein. Um, which actually gets used a lot in bio in biology research because you basically chemically attach green fluorescent protein onto another protein that you're interested in, and you can track where that protein goes in the organism by just shining UV light on it and seeing what glows green. Like yeah, exactly. Like a tracer. And so, and a tracer, I guess, I guess maybe we are getting to the nuclear reactions in the body part today. Um, <laughs> A tracer in, in terms of x-rays or in terms of MRIs or CT scans um, is basically when you intentionally inject a short-lived radioactive isotope into your body so that you can track where it goes in the body by watching where the radiation travels. And it's a significant amount of radiation, but just doing that once or twice in your life is not likely to give you cancer or lots of mutations. Um, if you did that every day for your entire life, well, your life wouldn't be very long. Um, it would be very bad for you. But that's it's similar to what's happening. It's a, it's a lot less destructive and longer lived if you use green fluorescent protein. You just have to have a way of chemically attaching that to what something else that you care about. So the reason we use chemical or we use um, nuclear tracers partly is because you can use specific isotopes of certain elements, like for instance, iodine, um, is predominantly processed and used in your thyroids and other glands in your body. So if you're having a thyroid condition and they want to know what's going on, they give you a specific isotope of iodine that's radioactive so that they can track, oh, the iodine's getting stuck in this one particular piece of your thyroid and not making it to both thyroids, for instance. And that can allow them to diagnose some things. Um, green fluorescent protein, GFP, can, can happen can use similar techniques, um, but it's a little bit harder to use in humans because you have to be able to attach it to the proteins you care about. Um, and then these last two, just because it's significant, relevant, and important, um, is there any way we can stop global warming um, or is it too late at this point? 
well, it's kind of too late. We can mitigate it. We can make it not quite so bad as it might be if we stopped burning fossil fuels today. Um, not stopping right now, it's, it's a little bit, it's not a, a binary option, right? It's not climate change happens or it doesn't. Um, it's just how bad is it going to get? And we still have the opportunity to try to mitigate some of that. Um, and so, which is why it is, it's a significant issue. And we can talk about, we'll talk about the, the scientific evidence that saying that climate change is happening, we'll go over that because that is related to light. Basically the same stuff we're talking about um, right now is the fundamental underpinnings of, of how we know climate change is happening. Um, and just as a informational item, um, scientists have known climate change anthropomorphic, not anthropomorphic, anthrop anthropogenic, thank you, um, hum human caused climate change um, was a thing since the late 1800s. Um, Svante Arrhenius was a Swedish chemist who did the calculation and said, hey, this whole industrial revolution thing is putting a lot of CO2 in the air. Just how much CO2 would it take to change the climate? Uh, he ran those calculations in like 1880 or so, um, just post-Civil War, and was able to come to the conclusion it was going to change the climate of the entire planet. Um, of course, him being Swedish and neglecting some other variables meant that he actually thought it was going to be a good thing for humanity um, because, you know, it's cold in Sweden and warmer, warmer uh, earth means more farmable land um, in his mind. So while he missed the boat on some of it, it's not a new concept. The math and the physics behind it has been around for a long time. Um, which brings me to why is propane considered clean burning compared to other natural gases? It still releases CO2. It just, it burns the CO2 or burns the carbon more completely. So you only get CO2 and water as your byproduct as opposed to also getting smoke and soot and methane and other hydrocarbons um, that you get from a lot of other, um, other combustion sources. Right, which is why your flames don't burn yellow and don't have soot when you use um, a gas stove. But if you tried to cook over a candle or a campfire, you get soot and smoke building up on the outside of your vessel really, really quickly, right? That's all the incomplete combustion. Basically, you're not burning your fuel all the way, which leads to other greenhouse gases that are even worse than CO2. But anything that you burn, any carbon source that you burn is going to produce CO2 and be contributing to climate change. It's just a matter of just how bad is it? Is it like the worst possible case scenario or is it just like moderately bad? Um, so, you know, the whole clean, clean coal, clean natural gas power plants, that's all, none of that is really clean or doing anything about climate change. It's just making it not as bad as it could be. Jacob? How about atomic energy? If, if you don't think of the factors of um, blowing up next. Um, let's, so we'll talk more about nuclear because there's a, several other react or questions and quizzes that I didn't get a chance to put on here that relate to nuclear energy. Um, so we'll, let's, we'll talk about nuclear next week. Um, we'll do, we'll talk about that in a significant way and how the vilification of nuclear power plants has led to the state where we are right now. Um, anyway, stuff that's more relevant, how do you do temperature changes like our Q equation actually ever show up in the real world? Turns out, yes, if you care about the numbers and getting things right, you do it in, instinctively already. You might not realize it, um, but like, and all the way going all the way back to like a blacksmith taking a piece of hot iron and quenching it in water. The water is still pretty close to room temperature because the specific heat of water is so high compared to a metal. Um, the, the example that I use all the time is thinking about boiling water to make coffee in the morning. Um, if you're boiling water to make coffee in the morning, you don't want it to take forever, right? So using the right burner on the stove, using the right vessel, 
um, not boiling way too much water, all those things go into it. And you do that instinctively, but it is Q equals MCP delta T. Um, the one there where it's really, really obvious is if you ever brew beer. If you, when you brew beer, in order to convert the starches in barley and in grains into something that yeast can digest and ferment, um, you have to take that, that grains and you have to steep it. It's called mashing it, but basically you're making barley tea. Um, but the problem is you need the, the enzymes in the malted barley to break down the starches, which means you have to be at a temperature range between 148 and 152 Fahrenheit. And you need to hold it at that temperature. So knowing what temperature you need to start your water at before you dump in the grain depends on how much grain you have, how much water you have, what's the specific heat of grain, what's the specific heat of water, all of that goes into, okay, I need to get my water up to 165 Fahrenheit before I dump 12 pounds of grain into it. And that's gonna bring the final temperature of the whole system to 151 Fahrenheit. It's literally Q equals MCP Delta T. Um, and you know, a lot of times there's, there's calculators that do that, that, those kind of calculations for you, but that's just one example. Anytime you have something changing temperature, you can think about it in terms of Q equals MCP delta T. And there are some times in, in every field where that's gonna be a, an issue, especially in fields like culinary fields, brewing, beverage um, service, that kind of thing. Uh, one's most directly related to subatomic particles. If we're not given the mass, would we assume the number of neutrons is the same as the number of protons in a specific Adam, is that right? Do we assume that that's the case? No, we, we can assume that the total mass is whatever it's closest to a whole number on the periodic table. So for instance, if we looked at say silicon, silicon has a mass of 28, actually silicon's a bad example because it is the same in that case. Let's use iodine. Iodine's got an atomic number of 53 and a mass number of close to 127. If I don't give you a specific isotope of iodine, round that mass to the nearest whole number and assume that's your total number of protons plus neutrons, right? So you would assume that it's got 53 protons because it's iodine. The number of neutrons would be 127 minus 53. The further you get away from the, the um, beginning of the periodic table, the less you're likely to find things at a one-to-one -one ratio when it comes to protons and neutrons. Um, and in fact, this is all related to, uh, let's call it the Valley of Stability. So the Valley of Stability is a term that's given to, uh, if we look at a graph of number of neutrons versus the number of protons, anything in the, in the blue area means it's pretty stable. So you actually have a very specific region of neutrons versus protons where you actually make stable isotopes. If you get away from that, or if you get too big, and actually I want the, I want the other one. Yeah. So here's one that's where it's a little bit, it's not in terms of binding energy, it's in terms of the half-life. So all of the black dots are isotopes that are stable enough that they don't decay in terms of radiation. Um, anything that's colored means it's an isotope that's stable enough to be measured, but that will spontaneously break apart into pieces or change something about its nuclear structure to become more stable, right? And so the this line that's, that's drawn right there, it's, it says Z equals N. So that's the line that corresponds with having the same number of neutrons and protons. And you can see that down here at the bottom, 
you wind up with a lot of, of black dots right along that line. But then as you get to larger nuclei, it sort of curves a little bit. And the most stable nuclei have significantly more neutrons than protons. And once you get to a certain point, n equals 126, um, there are no stable isotopes that we've discovered. It's just a matter of how unstable are they. So everything above the um, atomic number of lead will decay through nuclear processes. It will break apart in one way or another. So in this little section off to the top, right up there, that corresponds with, with the synthetic elements. Um, we have not been able to make anything in this region where we would expect this, this line to sort of continue in that direction. But in theory, there should be some very stable isotopes um, of very super heavy metal atoms or elements there where they have just that right ratio of protons and neutrons where they have a, a significantly longer half-life than say a lot of the synthetic elements that have a half-life in the, you know, two, let's see, this is the half-life in terms of seconds. So I think it's missing a negative sign there. Oh no, never mind. That's the blue. Um, so something more like two that dark blue here, that color is 1.6 times 10 to the minus five seconds. That's the half-life for those things to decay. You notice there's a lot of those up here in the synthetic elements. So we make a lot of stuff that's not very stable, but theoretical physics says that there should be stuff that's more stable around there, but it's all tied to that ratio of protons to neutrons. And getting that right ratio of protons and neutrons is why some isotopes are stable and some isotopes aren't. No. All right, and so that gets to answering this question too. Why is it radioactive? Because it's got too many protons and neutrons. It's just too big and there's not enough binding energy holding it all together. And so everything that's bigger than lead has that issue. It's just a matter of how quickly does it decay. All right, and last but not least, what does charge, I'm gonna rephrase this one slightly. What determines charge in an atom? We know that one, right? Electrons. Protons determines what element you have. Electrons compared to protons tells you what the charge is. Extra electrons means a negative charge. Too few electrons means a positive charge. And it's all my fault. No, it's all Ben Franklin's fault. All right. So this was just to recap where we were the other day. We've already talked about this a little bit. If you add energy, if you absorb energy in, um, in a system, you can promote an electron to go from a low energy state to a higher energy state. If you let an electron fall back down to a lower energy, you have to give that energy away some way, somehow. But because it has to happen all at once, it usually does that in the form of light. So if we think about a bowling ball rolling downhill, the bowling ball is giving away energy the whole way down the, the hill, right? So it's giving energy away slowly. It's not eat all the way, it's not one state or the other. It's constantly giving away energy. But because electrons can't do that, because of quantum mechanics, they have to cease existing at the higher energy state and start existing at the lower energy state and give away that extra energy all at once. And the way that that happens is by emitting a photon. It creates a photon, which then leaves the system. And depending on how big a difference there is in these 
energy states that's going to determine what the wavelength of the light is that's emitted. So our bigger gap means the higher energy photon. And everybody who had, who had lab on Monday, a higher energy photon means what in terms of wavelength? It means a shorter wavelength, right? Yeah, and it, it is a distance. We use the same, the same language to talk about wavelength that we would use for any distance, any length, the short versus long. Um, we don't usually, you can talk about a large wavelength as well, just like you could talk about a large distance, but it's just in the weirdness of the English language, we usually would refer to it as a long distance, not a large distance. Not technically wrong, it's just weird. Um, let's see. So we saw some of these barcodes in lab, and if you didn't have lab yet, you will today see some of these barcodes, and we'll use that to identify different, um, we can use that to identify different elements just by looking at what these barcodes look like. What wavelengths of light do you have emission happening? Um, and the other key is absorbed versus emitted. Absorbed versus emitted. Absorbed means you're putting the energy into the electrical system, the, the electrons. Emitted means your electrons are losing that energy, right? So it's just another way of saying given away, like we would say lot losing energy in terms of temperature change. All right. So how do we know where we can put electrons and what energy levels we have to work with is going to be predominantly determined by basically the rules of quantum mechanics. The rules of quantum mechanics and what are called quantum numbers. So first off, and I tried to fix it so I could see where I was writing better. I put that black box there. Is that black box helpful or, or that little gray circle? Is that helpful for seeing where I'm writing or not? It doesn't make a difference to you? Okay. If you hadn't even noticed it, then it really isn't helping, right? So I'll turn that off next time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so these quantum numbers are basically the different types of waves that you can have. To go back to the, the guitar string um, analogy, the different values of the quantum numbers tell you where you can have one of those nodes, which tell you what type of harmonics you can have. In other words, um, they tell you what are the possible solutions to a certain to a certain series of equations, and those quantum numbers so are what are going to dictate the shape of the periodic table, right? And so you can write all of this stuff down, but at the same time, um, it's all on the periodic table as well. Because we can think of the periodic table as being broken up into blocks based on what type of orbital is being filled when you have that number of electrons. Right, so if we think about this, the lowest energy state that you can have um, is if you have a 1s orbital. And a 1s orbital can hold two electrons. But then you can, you can add more. There, there they are. Um, if you add more electrons than just two, they can't fit into the same energy level. So remember that, that diagram that I drew before? So it's like one S and the second energy level, there's two S and two P. And the third energy level, there's three S, three P, three D. Basically, every time you go and really, I should probably, since I keep using the word up to reverse this, you're always going to start the lowest energy state. And then once you fill up that low energy state, then you start filling up the higher energy states. So determining what type of orbital you're putting electrons in determines basically what types of orbital changes do you have, what kind of light can be emitted. 
how do these different orbitals behave, which ones are magnetic and which ones aren't, is all dictated by these orbitals. And so all of chemistry, basically, the, behavior, the difference in behavior between every single one of the, the different elements we have comes back to orbitals. So everything about the periodic table can be explained in terms of orbitals. And strong and weak nuclear force, but that's getting into nuclear reactions again. We're not doing that yet. Right? And so the, the way we can see this in the periodic table is if we look at it in terms of these big chunks that they call blocks, and I'm actually going to go back to periodic table here because it actually has a way of visualizing this in terms of, there we go, electrons. So this, basically the different colors here are representing what different orbital you're putting electrons in when you have that number of electrons. So if you wanna know how you add electrons or what state the different electrons are in, you basically start at one and you count until you get to the right number of electrons for your system. Right. So you can do that if you have a an explicit chart like this that ties different type of energy um, based or different types of orbitals based on what energy they are. You start the low energy state and you start filling it up from the bottom. So basically, this is just a more explicit way of writing this out. See how it's got almost the same shape 1s, then 1s, 2s, then 3s, 3p, 3d then 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f. This is just a more, a uh, better way of drawing it. And essentially, if you wanna know what the electrons look like, you just start the lowest energy state and you start adding electrons until you run out of electrons. So if we wanted to say, if we wanted to figure out what the electrons look like, this is a called a um, orbital, orbital diagram or an energy diagram. Um, let's say we were talking about neon. So neon Man. All right, so neon. How many electrons does neon have? Anybody have their periodic table in front of them? 10 electrons. If you have 10 electrons, the way we figure out where they go is we just start the lowest energy. Each one of these lines can hold a total of two electrons, one pointing up and one pointing down. So we just used two electrons and we filled the first energy level. We still have eight electrons left. So we're gonna to go to the next lowest energy orbital and put two electrons in it. We now have six electrons left, right? And each of these sections of the, of the 2p orbital, that, that whole, everything that I circled there is part of the 2p orbital. A p orbital has three distinct places to store electrons, basically. Spatially, there's three dimensions. So you can put a pair of electrons along the X axis, you can put a pair of electrons on the Y axis, or you can put a pair of electrons on the Z axis. And we have six electrons left. So we can go through, and we put one, two, three electrons, two, three more electrons. Our total number of electrons is 10. And we can look at this and say, okay, this is how the electrons are arranged in neon. And it gets to be a bit of a pain to write out this whole diagram every time you wanna do this. So what we typically do is we use a shorthand that we call an electron configuration. We would say that the electron configuration for neon, it's just supposed to be a colon. It's 1s, the 1s orbital 
has two electrons in it. Then we start filling up the 2s orbital and it has two electrons in it. Then we start filling up the 2p orbital, which has how many electrons in it? So that's the electron configuration for neon is we'd say it is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And here's the big picture is you don't need this chart to be able to get there. And you also don't need to memorize the order of these because the periodic table has all of that information built into it. The S block, oh, that was really messy. Means that when you're putting electrons into, if you're, when you're counting along, you're putting electrons into an s orbital when you're saying that atomic number. So remember, this is atomic number one. This is atomic number two. Really, helium belongs next to hydrogen over in the s block, but it behaves more like a, a noble gas. And we'll talk about why in a minute. If we wanted to count to figure out what the electron configuration for neon was, we literally could just start counting at hydrogen and go until we get to 10 electrons, until we get to neon on the periodic table. And we say, to know what type of orbital we're putting it in, we say, okay, we're, we're in the first row of the periodic table. So I'm in the first energy level. Therefore, we put a one. That one in front of one S is means, it's called the principal quantum number, but basically it means row on the periodic table. Or rather, I should switch that. Row on the periodic table means principal quantum number. And the only elements in, the, in row one are in the S block. So we say row one in the S block, and it can hold two electrons. And then we finish row one of the periodic table. Go to three. Three is lithium, right? So then we say, OK, well, lithium is in the second row of the periodic table. Lithium is in the S block, so we're putting electrons into the S orbital. And it's the S block is two elements across. You can fit two electrons in an S orbital, 2S2. After beryllium, beryllium corresponds with filling up 2S. Where's the next element? Boron, right? Still the second row, but it's in the P block. And the periodic tables that I gave you guys and it has on that you'll have for the for the final have the blocks labeled underneath each of them. If you know how to use the periodic table, it has everything you need to write these electron configurations. And so we're in the P block. And one of two things always happens. Either we have more electrons than we can fit, or we'll get to that number in this block. In the case of neon, we have six electrons left, right? Left, correct? So one, two, three, four, five, six gets us all the way to 10 electrons. And that corresponds with putting six electrons into that p orbital. If we had 11 electrons, where would the next electron go? What orbital? 3s. And how, if we have 11 electrons total, what are we going to write? What are, what are the, how many electrons do we have to put into the 3s? Just one. So for sodium, the electron configuration would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. So you don't need to have it memorized like this if you can just read the periodic table. 
Matt? So that electron configuration is essentially just telling you how many blocks you move for each one to get to that element, right? For now. For now. <laughs> what happens if we have an ion? What's different about an ion? The charge. The charge, right? The number of electrons. Mm -hmm. So if we had a sodium ion, With the plus one charge, what's the electron configuration of a sodium ion going to be? We have one less electron. We have one less electron, right? So you just get rid of that. So your electron configuration for an ion is just going to be the same as what you started with, just tweak. Either you have a couple extra electrons or you're missing an electron. In this case, for the sodium ion, it would be sodium 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And then nothing, right? That gets us to our 10 electrons. And they are always going to go in the same order. So you can have it memorized. In fact, we'll do this enough that at least the first few rows you will have memorized because there's only so many times you can write 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 before you have it memorized. And everything that's got more than 10 electrons is going to start with this. Um, so this is, there's one more thing I want to point out here before we move on. And we'll take our break in just a second. Is that the projector? It's not a good sound. Um, when you start getting up to the higher energy levels, there's some weirdness that happens with some of these larger. Ah. With some of these larger orbitals or energy levels. For instance, if you look at 3D, it's actually higher in energy than 4S. So you get to a point where because the orbitals start getting bigger and bigger, and because your energy levels get progressively closer and closer together, the higher you get, there's sometimes where it doesn't go strictly in order the way that the, maths, the math predicts it should. The real world is more complicated than the simple quantum rules that they first discovered. And so you actually fill up 4S before you get to 3D, which is why on the periodic table, the D block is actually offset a row from where it should be. The, the first row of the D block is actually in the third energy level, but it's in the fourth row of the periodic table. And that's just because it's higher in energy than that 4x. So you start filling up 4x, and then you start putting electrons into 3D. And it comes back to the fact that we're always just going to start from the lowest energy and work our way up. Right. And so a more accurate periodic table in terms of electrons might look something like this, where if you started at the bottom, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon. So getting to neon would be the same. They're color coded where every color is an energy level, but where they are vertically is tied to their, their energy, right? So you fill from the bottom up, and that means you fill up 4S before 3D, which is, you're not going to have this version of the periodic table on the test. So using this version of the periodic table, it's helpful to just to remember, OK, well, this first row of the, period of the D block is in the fourth row, but I know that it belongs to n equals 3. Right? And so writing your, period, your um, electron configurations for anything from the fourth row down gets a little bit trickier. It's the only time it gets any trickier. So if we wanted to do something like gallium, number 31 there, 
I'm going to say we're talking about gallium when it's neutral. How many electrons do we have to work with? 31. If we want to know what the electron configuration is, we just start at the beginning. So gallium is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. I know I did that quickly, but that's just counting along. One first row of the periodic table in the S block holds two electrons. Now I'm in the second row of the periodic table in the S block, and that also holds two electrons. Now I'm moving over to the still in the second row of the periodic table, but we're in the P block, which can hold six electrons. Then we're in the third row of the periodic table, back to the S block, which holds two electrons. Then we skip over this middle section. We're in the third row of the periodic table in the P block, which holds six electrons. That takes us all the way to 18 of our 31 electrons, right? Now we're in the fourth energy level. So four, and we're back in the S block. S can hold two electrons. This is the one time there's going to be a disconnect though, because then we go back and finish filling up the N equals three. Right, it's the first row in the, F, in the D block, but it belongs to N equals three. And you can see that well, let me zoom in. You can see that on this chart here on P table, it fills it in and say, okay, well, 4S and then 3D is the first D orbital that we have to work with. And how many uh, elements across is a D orbital or D block? It's 10. If you just count from scandium to zinc, it's 10 elements, which tells us that the orbital holds 10 electrons. Again, you don't need to memorize it if you know what that's, that that's what the periodic table is trying to tell you. That gets us to 30 electrons. We have one electron left. Where does it go? Four, P, one. All right, let's take a break there. I know we went a long time on that one, but it's because we had that quiz at the beginning. Um, let's come back at uh, 25 after, and we'll do more practice with this and explain how it works in more detail. Wait, so so what's your first your first F orbital then? What's your first F orbital? What energy level is it going? So that's that's the first the first element in it. What's what energy level? Like N equals Close. It's the, the F block is actually off by two rows. This for the same reason. So it'd be four F. Just remember every time you go up an energy level, you add a new type of orbital. So the first F orbital is when you get to N equals four. And again, we'll practice with that more. And that's more gen chem. You don't need, uh, we're not going to deal much with F orbitals in this class. Yes.
So I just wanted to see if I was getting into it. So like the team. One S2. And then the next one would be two S2. With this chart, you can start now. Yeah. And then it would be the D block it's a little bit weird because it doesn't always fill up in exactly the right order yeah. that we would expect. But for, the, for this class, we're pretty much going to deal with either empty D blocks or full D blocks. Okay. We're not going to really deal with the partially filled. Okay. For Gen Chem, we'll get into that. We'll be able to talk about why there's some weirdness. Okay. Cool. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, no, they could, we call it 25 Celsius is, is pretty common. Um, Actually, zero Celsius. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you'll be able to get all the data in the first the first hour or so. So as long as you can stick around for that, and then the write up. Yeah. As long as it's okay. Yeah. And you you have the um you have a whole week to finish finish it. So it doesn't need to be cumulative in that. So that's totally fine. Okay. Oh, thank you. Did you mean to leave radar and look for bolt? No. Okay. <laughs> I double checked to make sure there was nothing from row seven, but I apparently missed that part. <laughs> so Derek, if you want, if you go to this website, you can play around with it and you can, you can to put it at different temperatures. Just going to, from 25 to 30, you get a few others that turn liquid. And you just scan upward. And then we should hit a bunch of the metals will change really quickly here. Oh, I'm sorry, going back down. <laughs> Oh, yeah. That makes sense. So, I was looking at the periodic error. What's defining? Yeah. You got to pick, you got to pick a constant. Or... <laughs> Would you do like 
So that same rule applies to every row. After, after yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Victoria. The reason it's worth worth at least starting with their credentials is because historically not using somebody's credentials has been a way to minimize their accomplishments. So for it, so it doesn't bother me as a cis white male, but you know, a woman in sciences who had worked extra hard to get their PhD wants to be referred to by a PhD because they're tired of getting called miss all the time. Right. I don't care. Which which makes those those people that do care, it makes them really frustrated that I don't insist on the title because that makes them look like dicks when they do insist on the title. There's power dynamics is a whole thing even in academia. All right, quick announcements. The um, I forgot to hit record on Monday. So Monday's lecture with the uh, talking about quantum and 
you know, the history of electrons and orbitals um, didn't get captured. It's forever lost to posterity. They're horror for it. Um, but I do have last year's. So it was delivered from my home office during COVID. Um, so it's not, it's not exactly going to match up with the stuff that we, that we covered. Um, but if you miss lecture on Monday, you can watch this lecture and it'll have most of the same information. Um, a few things here and there that'll, that are a little different, but for the most part, it's the same thing. Um, and I'll do that going forward. I think I still have all of my lectures from last year. Again, the due dates, anything, any specific assignments I'm talking about might not match up. So don't rely on last year's lectures when it comes to um, you know, knowing what quizzes are coming up or anything like that, or when any due dates, but for the material, at least you can still get to it from here. And it's not going to be the same quality. That's my home mind. That's a really bad pause. So that happens this COVID. Um, so we can, we can move on from that. <laughs> All right. So when we're talking about, one more thing that's worth talking about when it comes to these, um, these orbital types that are offset from where they should be, where the orbital energy doesn't quite match up with the principal quantum number with the energy n equals one, n equals two and stuff. Um, so the d orbital is offset by one spot. If we look at the, if we go back to the, this view here. So everything in the d block is off by one row from where it should be, right? So, so yttrium is in the fifth energy level or is in row five, but that last electron goes into the 4d orbital. The same logic applies down here for the, the lanthanides and the actinides. The F block is offset actually by two energy levels from where it should be. The first F orbital that you can get to technically belongs to N equals four. But because of the shape of these orbitals, it actually winds up being higher in energy. And I'm gonna go back to the guitar string analogy. Um, these, these Orbitals have these shapes. The orbital basically is just a mathematical function in three dimensions that describes where you're likely to find an electron spatially. And so this, the simplest orbitals, there's actually little depictions down here. The simplest orbital is just a sphere. But if you get to more higher energy orbitals, it's a sphere with a phase change in the middle where it goes from up to down, but it's not tied to charge and it's not tied to spin. It's a different variable um, called phase. If we look at the two P, P orbitals basically look like a figure eight that tend to be centered around one of the three axes in three dimensions, X, Y, or Z. But that figure eight has more curvature, it's a more curved shape than a sphere. A sphere that has the same surface area has less curvature to it, which means this is actually higher in energy than this. That's why we go up the, the S orbitals first. They're lower in energy because they're not as curved. Just like a guitar string that's vibrating like this, is lower energy than one that's vibrating like that. The more curvature you add, the higher energy your orbital type gets. And a D orbital has even more curvature than a P orbital. A D orbital looks like a clover leaf. So in that would be like adding our, our next harmonic. It looks like that. That's more curved than those two, right? So S orbital, P orbital, D orbital. F orbitals get even more curved. They get even more complex functions. You start seeing these really weird looking, 
and you can actually see them in 3D here. I don't think it'll, it won't, well, maybe it'll let me, I've gone too far. There, it's up there. Um, you see how complicated that shape is. And it's basically a sine wave in spherical coordinates. If you have a sine wave in spherical coordinates, it will naturally make these sort of either sphere shapes or figure eight shapes or cloverleaf shapes or more complicated looking shapes. Um, and so because of that, we wind up with these F orbitals are higher in energy um, and are offset by two whole rows from where they should be. All right, so with that in mind, if we ever, if we do anything with the F block, um, the, it starts getting a little bit tricky to keep track of, of these things. For the most part, we're not gonna deal with the F block in this class. When you get to Gen Chem, we'll talk about it in more detail. Um, the other thing is, is that for the D block and the F block, because they're so big, they get some weirdness with the way that they fill up. Um, and so they don't actually fill up as predictably as just count how many spaces over it is. For instance, the electron configuration for copper is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, which we can abbreviate as just putting a noble gas in brackets. You put a noble gas in brackets in electron configuration, that means, okay, everything looks normal up until R dot. And then we can build from there. So that saves you some writing. Um, for this class, you can only use this shorthand if we're talking about more than 18 electrons. If I'm asking you to do an electron configuration for something with less than 18 electrons, then I want you to show me that you can do 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Monotonous, yes, um, but this is an intro level class. So you have to show me, you know, the intro level stuff before you get to use the, um, the abbreviations. So to continue on talking about copper for a second, copper does this weird thing where once you get to argon, we would say, okay, well now trying to get to copper at 29, normally we would say, 4s2, 3d9, right? That's our normal rules would predict that. The problem is orbitals get are way more stable when they're either all the way empty or all the way full or exactly halfway filled. But again, we'll save that for Gen Chem for the most part. So with that in mind, instead of following the rules here, copper actually breaks the rules and it steals one of the 4s electrons because then it can actually fill this up all the way. So copper's electron configuration is actually not what we would expect. It looks like that, 4s1, 3d10. And there's a lot of exceptions to this rule, to our, our normal rules in the D block and in the F block. So for this class, I'm not going to ask you about any electron configurations that have a partially filled d orbital. Everything is either going to have an empty d orbital or a full d orbital. I might ask you to explain why this happens, but I will give you, I'll say copper's electron configuration looks like this. How come it doesn't follow our normal rules? And your answer on the test would just be something along the lines of, well, because a full d orbital is worth more than a full s orbital. The larger the orbital is, the bigger the bonus we get from having it all the way filled. Matt, you look like you had a question a second ago. I was actually just about to ask why did that happen? Yeah, so they're both, are, we have to choose one of these to be full and one of them to be almost full, right? The fact that the s orbital only holds a total of two electrons means it's not as important as having a full d orbital. So a larger range needs to be filled before a shorter range. Yes, a lar larger orbital. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So again, this is why I'm not going to say, give me the electron configuration for rhodium. 
because you guys don't know enough yet to be able to do that according to our rules. But I might say, give me the electron configuration for indium because indium only has full d orbitals, no partially filled d orbitals. Indium. Would silver behave similarly? Silver does behave the similarly. Um, which is one of the reasons why silver, copper, silver, and gold all make really good conductors for wiring is because they all have that similar property of being resistant to corrosion because they have a full D orbital and still being conductive because they have this one extra electron that sits around by itself. Yeah, so those are actually what, what are called the coin metals. The coin metals are all in the same column in the periodic table. They all have this very similar electron configurations just off by one energy level. The electron configuration for silver is going to look like, we can use this bracket notation for the last noble gas that we went through was krypton, right? So we can say KR in brackets means everything's cool until we get to krypton. And then, 5s1 for d10. So basically, the reason that Mendeleev's periodic table works, the reason that things are grouped into columns that have similar properties is because their electron configurations look the same, but off by an energy level. So everything in column 18 have, corresponds with having a full energy level or a full P orbital, which is why they all behave the same way. I can't just say just a full energy or a full P orbital because helium doesn't even have a P orbital, but it did, does have a full energy level. N equals one is full when you put two electrons in it, and then you start N equals two. So everything across the board is more stable when you get to having all full electrons or all full orbitals or all the way empty orbitals. Right, and so the, the <coughs> come back and do that in a second, but I wanna talk about how we, some of the properties that emerge from these similar electron configurations the, the, I don't know if simplest is the right word, but the first one that we're going to look at is number of valence electrons. Number of valence electrons is how many electrons are in the highest energy level. Not the highest energy orbital, the highest energy level. So in other words, that row of the periodic table. So if we wanted to say how many valence electrons are in say carbon we would go to carbon and you can either look at it on the periodic table or you could write the electron configuration you write the electron configuration for carbon you get 1s2 2s2 then what? 2, P, 2. The number of valence electrons is how many electrons are in the second energy level. So you just add up everything that has a 2 in front of it is the second energy level. So that allows us to say, okay, well, carbon has four valence electrons. So let's go back to gallium. How many valence electrons does gallium have? It's already written over here. So what's the highest occupied energy level? Four. N equals four, right? How many electrons are in N equals four? One, two, three. <laughs> So there are three valence electrons for gallium. It's just everything that has a four in front of it can total up those exponents. They're not really exponents. You're not squaring anything. It's just a way of keeping track of electrons. 
So in other words, that D orbital doesn't count towards valence electrons because it's always one energy level off from where it's supposed to be. Right, so everything in the D block has the same number of valence electrons. How many valence electrons? And we can even use the little figure in the at the top here. The electron configuration for calcium. Go away. Go back to the way it was. I don't know how to get rid of that now. Okay, that works. So for calcium, calcium's electron configuration is 4s2, or is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. How many valence electrons? Two. Two. What about for titanium? Also two. It's got two more electrons, but they went into a D orbital, which means they don't count as being in the fourth energy level. So everything in the D block, unless it's one of those weird exceptions, is going to have two valence electrons. All right, let's let's do some practice for these electron configurations. We just did calcium, right? So calcium, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. Or if you're using that short, this is more than 18 electrons, right? So if you wanted to, you could use that shorthand and just say it's argon plus 4s2. These mean the same thing. Argon in brackets just means all of this. What about calcium of the two plus? It would just be the same as argon. We have 18 electrons. So the, the electron configuration, and make note, I made a, I made very carefully sure to say um, more than 18 electrons, not 18 or more. So if it's 18 electrons, you've got to show the whole thing. Again, the point is that I want you to show me and to practice writing this enough times you could never possibly get this wrong and eventually get to the point where you can be talking about something totally unrelated while you're writing it out because you've done it so many times that there's no possible way you could get it wrong. So we just take the highest energy electrons to get rid of them. Because that, that's going to make the calcium more stable because now we don't have a partially filled fourth energy level. Now we have an empty fourth energy level and all filled orbitals up to 3p6. So this also allows us to predict what charges are going to be stable. What about zinc? We'll do zinc and zinc ion. And then we'll call it a day. <clears throat> 
zinc when it's neutral is going to look like argon plus what? Or S2. Or S2. 3D10. What does zinc with a plus two charge look like? Not quite, only taking away two electrons, not 12. So it's going to start like argon, yes. That's what our rules would predict, except that means we have to break up a full D orbital, right? We just got done talking about how once a D orbital gets filled, it's super stable. It doesn't want to ever break this up again. We just scrap the 4s2 and leave it as 3d10. So you fill up the s orbitals first and then go to the D orbital. But when you're taking electrons away, you take them away from the s orbital first. So one more time. Gallium, when it's neutral, has its electron configuration we've already used a few times, right? What is gallium with a plus three charge going to look like? So gallium looks like argon, 4s2, 3d10, 4p1. So gallium 3 plus looks like argon. We're just going to take our three electrons out of those P, the P and the S, get rid of the fourth energy level, and that leaves the third energy level completely filled. What'd you say? No, so, so we're always trying to get the energy. Yeah, if you if you have enough electrons to fill up a D orbital. You're never going to break it apart again, right? No matter how many electrons you lose, I guess I shouldn't use absolutes. There's probably some case where you can do that, but your general rule is once you fill up a D orbital, you don't break it up, All right? So take any other electrons away first before you do that. All right, and that's a perfect place to end for today. And we'll talk more about periodic trends on Monday. Don't forget to take the quiz this weekend. And I'll see half of you in a few minutes.